Thank you very much. This is um, the second group presenting. I hope you are getting me clearly. I'm from Kenya, Nairobi. We are with Adam from the Middle East, I believe. Yes. Yes. So, Karibu, Let me try to get our, I, our idea here on this presentation is the impact of uh, adoption of the scientific calculator in modern education to promote critical thinking and project based learning in STEM education. Mr. Moderator, kindly, this is um, how many minutes do we have? This is a workshop. How much time have you planned for? Uh, actually, they gave us 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Yeah. Ooh. Is that OK? Can we reduce it to 20 minutes? To 20? Yeah, they said 20. Do your best. 30. They said 30. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try the best we can. OK. Thank you very much. So we are presenting on behalf of Semaste and Casio as partners, and uh, we are Mohamed Kamardin uh, from Casio, Nancy Nui from Semaste, and Diambo from Semaste. Yep. Mohamed, go ahead. Okay. Yes, so in our next um, session, we are asking ourselves, why STEM? because our conference about STEM, generally as our keynote speaker mentioned earlier, STEM is very, very critical. And, and we really need to look at it in a very, very special way. And I like the approach Dr. Miheso gave it like an upside down and the way we use words to describe our situations. So we are simply re-emphasizing from the keynote address to say that STEM, is very necessary to provide a solid foundation for science, technology, and innovations in schools. We, we are like saying the school is the place where we can make change and where change can be nurtured to really push the agenda forward. Edin. So we want to look at the traditional versus modern teaching. So when we talk of the traditional versus the modern teaching, we realize that traditionally we have taught or teachers have taught learners to memorize and recite knowledge versus the idea of interaction. We do know that in many of our systems in Africa, the assessment or examinations bodies try to emphasize or the way they ask questions in the examination, you either memorize or recite to reproduce or regurgitate. And these are the biggest problems. So you find teachers teach depending on how they are assessed, how their learners are assessed. If teachers have to teach well, then there must be a new way of assessment. And that will make the teachers run away from training their learners to memorize and recite, issues of remembering instead of discovering, issues of treating students at the same level of understanding, rather than emphasizing on differentiated learning, which emphasizes on inclusivity in education, especially now in sciences, STEM, mathematics, issues of understanding and applying versus analysis and evaluation. You cannot ask learners to interact, discover, differentiate, analyze, and they are taught by their teachers to remember, memorize in the examination. They go in tandem. Issues of replication versus critical thinking. Issues of relinquishing versus innovation. Issues of theorizing versus conceptualization and practical aspects of what learners learn and are taught in the schools. Issues of teacher-centeredness. The teacher knows it all. The teacher is the guru, the master of knowledge versus 
versus learner centeredness. So here in STEM, we want to really emphasize that we go in a situation where learner centeredness is the issue. There is a summary which is presented here diagrammatically to look at, if you look at those photos here, the teacher is on the board and on your right here, we have learners like discussing together and learning together. If you go to the next slide, we are emphasizing the issue or seeing again, the issue of paradigm shifts, AD move, so that we run away from content focus to focus on competencies. I can teach a learner how to ride a bike theoretically and they can rewrite that in the exam. But if I want the competency of this learner to ride a bicycle or a vehicle, I will go and give them the vehicle to see how they can ride it or how they can fly the plane so that they have the competencies rather than having the content. The content of riding a bike, they can have 100%. But the competency of riding a bike, they can get zero, which means whatever they have learned will not help them much. We are saying there should be a paradigm shift from rigid and prescriptive curriculum, which many African countries love and like, and we have refused to run away from the, our colonizers. So there's very limited flexibility. We want to move to a more flexible, where we give learners opportunity, pathways to get what they really need. Focus on summative assessment, which I've said, high stakes exam. We want to move to a balanced, well articulated, formative assessment and a less of summative assessment. So that you really get the learners every day as they learn, so that we don't crucify them in quotes at the end of three day examination. And this person has been in school all along. So let us de-emphasize the summative assessment. Also emphasis on schooling should be less. We move from that and move on emphasis on education. So education is the issue, how are we educating our learners? Then we want to move away as there are so many teachers here, we see some from Jinja and everywhere gathered in various conference halls, which is very good for us. Let us move away from teaching and focus more on learners. If I teach, what are my learners getting? Rather than chasing and covering the syllabus for you as a teacher, and yet the learner has not learned anything. So then, what is ICT integration? We want to bring technology in this. And my previous colleague who has presented from the Makerere University, I believe, was also trying to bring in the issue of TPAC, which is very, very critical. And it also emphasizes the issue of technology in education. What does it do? It makes the whole process of education more versatile. I can have the knowledge, yes. I can have the content, yes. But technology enhances that. In fact, it should make the work of teachers even better, more enjoyable, even learners more relaxed as they work on whatever they are learning. So in this um, slide, we are talking about what is it? What is this ICT? We want to see the teacher there, the learner, and ICT resources, the technology in it. So what do we say then, Eddie? We say that, um, Eddie, move on. ICT integration in learning is the process. That's why we are putting it in blue there, process, where teachers, who we want to talk of them as facilitators, use technology as a tool to help the teachers and their learners achieve the curricular and the instructional objectives. ICT, therefore, when it is integrated, is more than just availing technological tools. No, it is more than that. It focuses more on the effectiveness. How do you use those tools effectively? For example, now I'm using tools, I'm in Kenya in Nairobi, and I'm facilitating. Am I using these tools effectively so that you are getting meaning wherever you are in Africa to listen to my talk, my presentation? Is it clear, is it effective? And that's how we bring technology, ICT integration 
in our classrooms. It is not bringing technology, you put it in the classroom and as a teacher, you run away into the staff room. Eddie? So then, change towards modern teaching. Yes, move on. So when we're talking about this change with technology, it has changed the world of teaching as we knew it. Indeed, it gives, gives students, schools with access to new resources. It gives us a situation where we can collaborate. Now we are collaborating, like I'm using ICT technology here, learning tools, increased flexibility. You are learning from the school where you are. You have not moved to go to Kampala, but you are learning far away. That is flexibility. This is innovation. So we should encourage, as Dr. Mieso said in her keynote address, why can't we use this technology also to teach STEM? You are far away in that part of Kampala, Nairobi, wherever, and you use technology to learn STEM. So we could be asking ourselves who? Teachers, teachers are, and who they teach remains the same. What teachers stand for and what they aim to accomplish hasn't altered. So where teachers work and they do what they do, whatever they do still also remains the same. But we want to inject more into it to make it better by using a technology that we'll focus on in a short while. So if you look at what the slide now we have, you can see the ocean of ICT tools. There are many, there are several. It is the teacher, the facilitator, who now chooses what to use best so that they can impact, they can really get to the learners to learn well. Our focus here towards the tools, the many tools will be on modern teaching, and we are not going to look at all those ICT tools. We want to focus on a specific one, which is a divine. We have okay, several devices we can use for modern technology. There is some, some disturbance, Kidogo. Can the moderator mute those who are talking? So we could categorize this modern teaching by using devices like computers, television, digital cameras, interactive smartphones, data storage devices, DVCs, memory sticks. But the highlight we have there is a calculator, which my friend will emphasize in a short while. We have productivity tools, Word, Excel sheet, PowerPoints, which I'm using to present here, Microsoft 65, Office, and the others. We have such tools, we have the e-library, Google Scholar, among us others. We have collaborative tools, WhatsApp, Google, ETC, the ones we use for social media. We have conferencing and interactive tools, Zoom, Google Meet, WebEx, Teams, Google, ETC. We have Zoom, which we are using now in this conference. We have learning management system, we have Google Classrooms, Moodle, Edmodo, Portals, etc. We have meeting tools, we have assessment tools, and we also have creating resources. Like this meeting is now being recorded, yes. This one is a summary of the changes we can see in um, the modern teaching tools, which we'll send as we share this, we can see it when we share our slide. Move on kindly. So lastly, we want to look at, uh, before we move to the actual uh, area where we want to focus on the tool, which is called a CASIO calculator, I want to talk about a little bit of ICT and special needs. In, in ICT, we have to look at some of our learners, the situation in which some of our learners are. And you'll agree with me, there are some learners who have disabilities. Maybe they cannot see, maybe hearing impairment, 
Maybe there are physical challenges. So how does inclusivity tackled in this scenario? So you look at the various tools in ICT that could help. And in hearing impairment, when somebody may be have got hard hearing or they can partially hear, what could help there is our headphones with amplified sounds or signed devices. We also take care of visually impaired. People who maybe cannot see totally, that is the blind. People who can maybe see, but again, their sight is interfered with by coloring or size of the letters. So here you can have narrations as we should have one in this conference for people who have disabilities who cannot get such that when I'm talking, you have captions, all right? In TVs nowadays, they take care of that. You have captions at the end of the presentation. So you have also use of jokes or NVDS. For physical, you have voice inputs and adapted computer desks that they can use to assist them whenever they are tackling issues of SNE, special needs education. We note that while selecting IC tools for use during teaching, it is advisable and it also behoves the teachers to use devices that help learners learn, especially if they have got issues to do with special needs. At this point, we want to now refocus and I'll invite my friend Eden. We are presenting is all the way in the Middle East, but I want to invite him now to refocus us on the special tool called Casio Calculator. My friend, welcome, Karibu Sana. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Asante, Asante, Mr. John. Uh, first of all, I would love to say that uh, it's my pleasure to participate in Comsteda 19. Uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm Muhammad. I am part of Casio uh, educational team in the whole Middle East. Uh, basically, it's our pleasure to, to, to collaborate in this presentation with Semestia. To start with a brief description, uh, our team basically uh, work and operate in Middle East, including Egypt, Kenya, UAE, UK, Nigeria. Basically, we do trainings, we do simulations, as I'm going to show you now. We are indulged deeply in education material. Uh, personally, I'm an educational specialist in the Middle East. Um, we also support students, teachers, not only with documents. Our team generally in Casio is named as Gakuhan team. It's responsible for education. Uh, to continue discussing what my colleague, Mr. John, was uh, uh, presenting, I'm going to first present the aspects of modern teaching. As a first aspect of modern teaching, I would love to talk about real life examples. Okay. Real life examples, basically, it's one of the most important aspects in our life as students not only need to understand in classrooms uh, about the theory or the idea that the teacher is explaining, students must connect, students must and need to relate to real life. For example, this is a grade one. Uh, activity which is known as scavenger hunt. It's an uh, activity in modern teaching could be done where students can, for example, number one is saying uh, a picture with a rectangle on it. Okay, let's say students and teachers are discussing rectangles in classrooms. Students need to feel, need to touch, need to see, need to relate. What are rectangles in real life? Okay, a table is a rectangle. So the idea of this, students need to relate and connect to real life. This is one of the main features in modern teaching. Moving on to other forms and grades. This is also another grade, high school grades, where basically all questions about trigonometry 
are about airplanes, are about ladders, all these objects where we can find on daily basis in our home or houses. So teachers need to relate from theory to real life, which we call real life example and relation in modern teaching. Moving on to another aspect, which is called problem solving methodology. Nowadays, this is a skill that we teach our students to, uh, to master it, not only in the classrooms, because they also need it in their real lives. For example, this is a question basically about trigonometry again, where students want to find a height of a building. Okay, one of the first methodologies of or steps in problem solving. So students can know how to start to solve this problem. Basically, it's define the problem itself. Students need to define the problem. In this case, okay, we are asking about height. So, and we have a missing side. This is mathematically focusing on. Yes, so students need to define what's the problem. I wanna find the height, I have an angle, et cetera, and et cetera. So the first thing is to define the problem. The second thing is to visualize and draw diagrams. Actually, I screenshot some of my students' work in the Middle East. Students draw uh, for this specific examples and show you how they can relate a drawing or a diagram to the problem itself. This helps students to visualize. It makes it easier for them to solve any single problems. Third step in problem solving methodology is to break problems into smaller pieces. Uh, actually, this is a skill that we all use in our daily lives whenever we face a complicated uh, problem. We, all, we always break it down into smaller pieces. This is exactly the same methodology or step should be followed in any problem solving, whether in real life or in math in this case. A fourth step basically is to collect info. Now, basically, here we're talking about collecting info about trigonometry and uh, uh, trigonometric ratios to be specific in the example. Of course, this is applied in any question and then depending on it. The last. And the last step basically is to solve the problem. And that is how it looks like. Um, yes. Mama, kindly help us to mute. The people are interfering kindly. Okay. So I'll move faster. Okay. 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 Uh, Mr. Okay. Snow, can, can you please help us just to. Okay. Hello, Nana. How are you? Oh, can please somebody help us just to mute? Ronald, Ronald, kindly help us to mute. You can mute them. I can mute them. Okay, mute them. Okay. Uh, to move forward about a very essential aspect in modern teaching, which is called critical thinking and analysis. Actually, students need to learn how to critical think. They need to start by clarifying or about the topic. To move fast, uh, forward, they need to question and eliminate what resources they have. They need to identify and basically all the arguments about the resources they have. Then they need to analyze the problem itself, going to evaluate the problem itself after creating basically after creating basically uh, a synthesis or a claim about the idea they are critical, they are criticizing. A fourth aspect of modern teaching, which is technology and independent learning. As my colleague, Mr. John discussed, a student before, I'm giving this example in mathematics, basically they were exposed to answers. So they need to, they used to imitate. The teacher came to classroom, comes to classroom and say, okay, two power one multiplied by two power two, you follow this specific rule to find the answer. The second figure shows students today as basically they use 
something called independent learning and critical thinking. So, two power one times two power two, they find the answer themselves as integer. Here, I would love to introduce. Here, I would love to introduce uh, one of uh, tools from Casio. I'm gonna sh share my screen. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Mm. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, going back to our example, so students can simply use the calculator itself to find any answer. So for example, if we're saying two power one multiplied by two power two, students can simply type on the calculator any expression, they can find the answer. As you can see, it's eight in this case. And simply, they can go back and share their input. Okay, can you see my screen again? Okay. Yes, you can see. Yes, so basically after they use the calculator, they can simply input and then deduce the rule. Here at this point, the student has a technological tool, which is a calculator. And by the way, this calculator is the new issued version uh, of calculators uh, from Casio. It's an extended version of the old version. It's, it's a sister version or updated version of the, of the previous calculator to be more specific. Uh, everything I said also applied for different examples. For example, if we're talking about functions and domains in mathematics, students, okay, yes, thank you so much. Students basically, I'm gonna share again. Student basically, if we're talking about functions, if you can see, students can directly define any function. Let's say our function is, for example, one over X, mathematically speaking. At this point, students can define their function uh, with type x. Then they can simply evaluate the function. Let's say if f, f of one is one over one is one. Let's say basically uh, f of zero here, the student will have math error because we cannot divide, we cannot have in the denominator is zero and mathematically speaking. So using the calculator itself, as I'm trying to say, as I'm trying to say, students can, in this case, find the domain. The student will realize alone that when we divided by zero, the calculator gave an error. So the domain would be all numbers except for zero in this case. These are just two past examples, just to uh, ease is the idea just to give you a sample on how this calculator can help students in independent learning. They can deduce the rules alone. Simply teachers will, will be facilitators as Mr. John already mentioned. They will just guide the students throughout the questions. The students will simply grab this calculator and then they can understand domains, they can understand ranges for example, and they can do any rule and deduce any activity on their own. This is as a main aspect in independent learning. To move forward, the last aspect is project-based learning. This is a very trendy and new aspect in education. Project-based learning is a method where students engage in real world and do projects. So students, no need only just to do exams and take grades. Students can go and explore. They can choose their topic. But the teachers also can give them topics. They can go and learn through projects. I'm gonna show you a sample done by Casio Middle East. It's about a basketball game. Student in this case receive this guidelines from, from, from schools or teachers. As you can see picture one, it has a driving question. How Basically, we are relating basketball to triangles and math. And this project, basically, teachers simply give resources, give a driving question to students. And then students use these resources, and then they can answer the questions of the teacher. In this case, it's called guided project-based learning, where teachers just give guides to students where to go 
to which resource to choose, but students is relating basketball in this case into math. This project specifically uh, is talking about when we play basketball, there's a rule called fast break rule when we have three players aligned and these three players on the field uh, for a triangle. That's how students start to relate. That's how students start to investigate in their project. One more thing to mention uh, is that students also can use their own resources. So they simply are handed the project by the teacher and the students can explore on their own. Students can learn on their own. And this is linked to other disciplinary subjects like physical education. We're talking about basketball. This is STEM. We are talking about math. We are in some uh, uh, projects, we can talk about science. We can talk about engineering. Here, where STEM relies in project-based learning as one of the trendy and the new aspects of modern teaching. I would love to share this slide with you, which is our portal in Casio, and this is also Semestia's portal. I would love to invite you all before I really uh, thank you for attending our session, and I hope it uh, was uh, beneficial for you. Uh, I would urge you all, as you can see, as you can, as you can see the link on the left for Casio. And so let's see your hands up, maybe open the microphone. Okay, so if we can all basically, I'm going to write on the chat. This was okay. Mm -hmm. Let me look for strand four and see if we can get there. Yeah, strand four. I shared the link with you. I'm okay. sharing the link with you on the chat so you can register on our forum. So you can get any updates. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much, Mr. Jambo. Thank you so much for everyone for attending. I hope you can share the minimum time as required, not 30 minutes. There is a question from the chat. Hello. Hello. We know we might have a couple of minutes. My friend who is talking, there's some noise from the background. Mr. Diambo. Yes. We, we need to we end here. Yeah. Yes, I'm just commenting. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good presentation. There's a question that's been asked by one yeah. of the participants. Let's yeah. keep, let's keep the question. Hand, let's keep the question. Mr. Hand, Jambo. Mr. Jambo, yes. let's keep the question. Let's keep the question. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. We need to move on. Mr. Jambo, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, can you take the Mr. Jambo stop sharing? Okay, I'll stop my sharing. We will need all the slides so that the other people can benefit from them. Mr. Jambo, can you start sharing? Hello, hello, good afternoon. Uh, please, uh, may I have a question you have as to build? Oh. All right, I think it's my turn to present. Uh, I'm Justice Nyamwea Nyagwancha. I'm presenting from USIU, and I'm presenting on a virtual environment for teaching mathematical lessons. Uh, this is a study we did at Auburn a few years ago. And uh, I'll present quickly because I said we have 15 minutes to do so. So first of all, let me say thank you for uh, holding the conference and uh, accepting our presentation. Uh, we did this with uh, Dr. Seals and uh, the other group members for the Human Computer Interaction Research Lab. But uh, uh, she's not in because uh, she's in the United I think right now she's in the US. I have not incorporated her in. So uh, this is uh, uh, going to be the way I'm going to present. This is my outline. I'll talk about the abstract shortly. I'll do introduction, uh, give you the motivation, problem statement. Then I'll talk about the solutions for that, a few of data, the data we collected, and then I give my remarks on the conclusion on uh, our research. So 
uh, our research, uh, the aim of our research was to try and develop something that is engaging to the students uh, as a teaching method so that uh, we discovered that uh, most of the students, and this is basically, let's say in the United States at that time, that uh, they get engaged so much when they play games. Uh, they can do that uh, for many hours uh, without any, any, any rest. So we try to say, how can we do something that uh, can be a teaching method or something that can teach students something in science or in math that is good as a game whereby they can get engaged without getting tired? Because every time for those of us who teach, you see that after a few minutes of lecture, students usually get bored, but they rarely get bored when they're playing these games. So uh, this research paper reports what we did as uh, we did a practical game um, and we used a smart table. Uh, to be able to do a small practical game. And then we did a study with a few teachers in uh, what we call the K-12 teachers in the local area around Auburn University. And then that's what we are reporting on what we found out uh, that uh, can we use a smart table or smart technology to replace or to ask uh, to help students gain concepts or gain understanding of mathematical uh, or scientific methods. So the aim of uh, our study was that um, uh, we wanted to use the multi-touch technology, which is the smart table from the smart technology. Motivate them because when students play games, they, uh, they, they are so motivated about the games. They don't, uh, you don't have to tell them anything about it. So what was our motivation? The motivation came up uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the smart table had put a concept out and say that uh, if a team uh, came up with a concept that uh, can be can teach a mathematical or scientific idea. They will give us a smart table, uh, the smart table uh, that uh, the smart table I'm talking about here. So they say that anybody who can come up with a nice concept that can teach math uh, or uh, some concepts in math uh, science, they will give us a smart table. Remember, the cost of the smart table at that time was around eight thousand dollars. So we we say that we need to get one because uh, at that initial time we used to go to local schools as a as uh, researchers from Open University. And we teach kids uh, on programming ideas. We teach them some scientific ideas. So we used all kinds of technology to be able to go there and develop their skills. And our major aim for that was, we wanted to encourage cooperation among kids and we wanted to level their thinking skills by giving them different activities to do. So we wanted to promote the so-called st student faculty interaction because we work with them uh, in those activities then uh, we will also uh, be able to do some evaluations, some kind of evaluation and that back and forth, uh, we thought it will uh, enhance the uh, learning experience of uh, this, uh, the computer science, uh, because we're in a computer science department. And some, we used to incorporate some from physics and mathematics, we would go as a team uh, to teach those kids in the, in the locality. So ours was to promote positive attitude towards subject matter. Uh, for those who came for physics, we made sure that uh, they will have to create that idea or that concept that uh, physics is a good area. For us who were in computer science, software engineering, so we were teaching computer science concept and using different methods to be able to do that. And we thought that if we had to one, the smart table could be one of our tools that we would be able to use uh, to be able to, to teach that idea. So this is the initial smart table that we are looking at. So the problem of the statement was that uh, the smart technologies who are hosting that contest wanted us to develop an idea, which is a programming idea or some idea to teach uh, kids uh, uh, some sound con uh, con concept. So uh, we had to find that a smart table. We couldn't buy one, but uh, in the uh, software development kits, we have a software development kit that can uh, simulate a smart table. So we decided that we can create a lesson or a game that can teach an educational or entertaining game that can teach educational material. And we say that we'll do it with the kids and then see how it will perform in terms of that. So we tried a few, but uh, finally we settled on um, uh, a, a game that can teach students to calculate area and the, peri and the perimeter uh, by being able to use figures, different type of figures. So we uh, create different of kind of figures. This is our inter interface. So we say that uh, what the student will do is that I will get this interface and then we give the students. And uh, our concept was uh, the kind of uh, different type of, 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 of objects will fall from the, the screen going down. And then we'll ask, we'll give students options to be able to choose the area or they'll say, can you find the perimeter? If you can create a perimeter, then you choose the perimeter and drop it on the game before the object will go under. So uh, it was a, it's a random kind of uh, 
kind of game. And we used uh, the Twitch's game environment, uh, which is for different type of games. And you've seen this kind of games that people play where object fall, and then you try to uh, dismantle most of them. So that was our concept. So we said, let's use that as an environment to develop that game so that students can be able to do that. So our intention was to say that because we need to teach area, we teach to teach perimeter to the perimeter to the students, that it will engage them. And in the process, they could have learned an idea. And then maybe later on, many other ideas can be taught uh, in that fact. So this was our area, our, 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 our concept. So the system, uh, the methodology was that we were required to, first of all, at least ourselves for the contest, then we, need to, we needed to acquire them smart table. But for us as software engineers, we downloaded the uh, SDK, the software development kit. Then we learned the software development kit and we developed now different uh, small, small games, but we settled on that one. So after we were able to do it, so we tested it. And uh, our main concept was that because initially we have had a lot of these virtual environments that are being used for different things. So that's why I said we tested in the input devices uh, idea because we wanted collaboration. Most of the other, most of the uh, the user the user interfaces don't usually accept multi-touch. So we had to go and uh, work on the input devices. We used the cave idea, which was uh, developed by the University of Chicago. Uh, they have a multi-touch idea, and that is where we got it to be able to implement it, so that you can have more than one student or two playing on it, so that uh, it can uh, be able to accept those multi-touch. Then it became like a competition among students, so that they could be able to uh, uh, get that experience of doing that. So after we did that, after it was able to, we were able to have the, 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 the simulation whereby we can have more than one mouse being detected. Then our testing was, uh, we used the usability experience and the user testing service, uh, which is uh, the software engineering way of testing systems. And then we add results and then we give recommendations. So that's our, our, was our methodology of doing that. So we did a development uh, whereby we used a multi-touch table mathematics game development uh, idea. And this is uh, hard to do also with uh, the kind of uh, technology we had to use. At that particular moment, uh, we had Windows 10 in action, which is an operating system. And when we developed the idea, we realized that uh, we could only be able to do one student. One of the issue was that Windows 10, when it was developed, they did not envision the idea of multi-touch. So it also took us back to try to see how do we implement this smart table issue so that we can have at least two to six students cooperating. Otherwise our idea uh, will have not been able to work. And remember, uh, we didn't have seven, $8,000 to buy the, multi, uh, the, the, uh, the, the table at the time. So we resorted to uh, going back and trying to see which of the operating systems add the, the capability. So we tested uh, the Windows 7 project system, didn't have, then we ended up using Windows XP because we realized that one had that idea at, uh, at the, 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 the multi-touch uh, implemented in it. So we created the, the, the mathematical table, uh, which was the area and geometry idea. So our area uh, perimeter game uh, will have random shapes that fell from the top. And then what the students will do is that um, they will ask you what's the perimeter of this uh, object. Then you will be given options. So you pick the options and drop them. So you, we had a, 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 you should have, initially we had two, two sections, two, uh, area, two whatever, uh, two uh, learners who would uh, cooperate. So one will be on the left and the other one on the right. And whoever was able to do it first will get them the, the points and the other one will not get the points. And it gave you an option whereby you can drop uh, the whatever. If it's wrong, it gives you another option to try again. So that uh, by the end of the day, whoever got the most points won the game. And we thought by so doing, I think uh, the, the, it, we can engage the kids as they are engaged in most of the games because our, our, our goal was to do the way the games, the normal games are done. So in order for a player to win a game, the, 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 the player must not have any more lives remaining, which means we could select five objects. They'll come randomly and then you will be able to do them within a given amount of time. And then you select whatever they're going and then you'll be getting your points on this screen. So that is uh, the screen for the scoreboard. So that uh, the more, the, the, earlier, the earlier you got the, the, the answer right and the, and the object, the better because it will give you uh, the, the outcome. So uh, player one and player two will sit there and then they'll play the game. And whoever got them right quickly will get most of the points. And we thought that is a, a good way of engaging and also teaching the students. So out of that, we had to do the data analysis uh, for the, the, the whatever, and this is how we did it. Before students will do the game, we'll give them a 
a questionnaire, which is a pre-questionnaire, which they will utilize to do the application. And then after they are finished the game, then we give them a post-questionnaire to find out. But uh, one of the things we tested uh, besides the learning and other stuff was usability, which I've uh, shared here. Uh, since a usability experience was one of our goals, because being a usability experience lab, we wanted to see what was the experience. So in terms of uh, experience, uh, you see the first, uh, on uh, this first uh, whatever I posted there is that uh, or on being wonderful between uh, we used a Likert scale of five, uh, we had a four plus four plus point points saying that it was uh, wonderful. Uh, secondly, out of the uh, seventeen teachers that we uh, used to do that, we just uh, uh, K twelve teachers uh, satisfying. Uh, we had uh, about four. Easy was uh, about three point five. Fun was above uh, almost four. And then flexible, flexible was around three point something, which was a bit lower. But if you look at that, that's the, most of the testers uh, were able to say that at least for that kind of game, uh, it worked. So we passed that on uh, Ben Snyderman is a criteria of presenting great experience. Uh, ben Snyderman is a usability experience. We can say a human computer interaction expert uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. So uh, then we have, uh, the other one was the post questionnaire on the same after they did the experiment. <sighs> Then we asked them to be able to do that, to, to be able to give us a post questionnaire on the say on a few things like, do you like the experience? What about, do you understand what you're doing? So you can see that we use a Likert scale of one to three and uh, uh, the lowest was uh, understood how to play the game without asking for assistance. So that was the lowest, which was uh, around 1.8. Uh, uh, because most of the time people get stuck because they'll drop and then the machine, because of one of the issues, it will freeze and they not work or they drop it because they did not put place it on top. It will give them no max. And then they have to ask and say how. So they thought it was not, they had to be told how to play that. But you see the rest of them, the game, uh, how the game will work with a simple explanation. They were able to find that out very easily in terms of the game, how easier in enforcing the, the lecture materials that we said that, that was easier because they said they gave us a 2.5 and the smart tables should be used for discussions. Most of say said say, say yes. And the reason why they said that, yes, is because it's fun. Uh, for them, it was a fun thing to be able to do So uh, on those. So I only presented those two uh, in terms of the data we collected because we had a whole lot of them. But in terms of experience, I think that's uh, what uh, we found out. So in terms of in terms of uh, uh, what we found out and the recommendation is that uh, the smart simple is a creative way of promoting fun in the classrooms while gaining understanding of concepts. So we also looked at it as a multi-touch. Uh, technology can be considered as a virtual class for supporting whatever idea you want to be enjoyable and also in terms of uh, people enjoy it and then use it to uh, acquire educational knowledge, you can uh, think of it, uh, of using it. So we said that uh, because we used a mathematical skill, we said that that can also be used to engage young students as well as allow them to be doing such a games and in the process, they will have this fun thing about mathematics, which is also as one of the speakers said earlier that uh, there is that issue of uh, uh, science has been put as like, it's just for the exclusive few. Uh, so most people get a cold feet in terms of trying to do it. So, but if they make it fun, I think some of the children will be probably think of uh, going to those areas or doing it as, a, as, a, as they do other things. So this new technology may be in French students in terms to pursue careers in, in science and others because us, doing that research from uh, uh, what you call a college a college perspective. Ours was to encourage students when they come to college to study science courses, uh, which our main for our lab, it was uh, to study computer science. So more often we can say that uh, the student's classroom can be translated into a virtual environment where students can be able to use that uh, to learn those, uh, those skills. So we can finally say that the smart table will continue to have Strong outlook and becoming an inspirational and impressive device to increase enthusiasm for learning among groups of students. And that was our conclusion at that time. So in terms of future work, we are thinking of, uh, not we're thinking because we, we have already, uh, two of our researchers have already worked on experiments on chemistry. They have published that. Others have worked on using uh, some more local areas like uh, air making and other stuff to teach mathematical courses. Uh, or science courses, and that has been published, and there are many others that are going on. So I think uh, uh, we will see, refocus our game uh, in terms of chemistry, biology, and other, which has always been done. Biology, nobody has done anything on biology, biological science, but on chemistry, physics, uh, there have been three, four uh, uh, publications out of that on that. So we that's about the smart table and our research, and I end there and I'll say any questions.
Okay, seems like there are no questions. All right, uh, if there are no questions, I hand over to the, uh, the person in charge so that they can uh, proceed with the other presentations. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Back to you. Are they still there? Yeah, myself have a question. Okay, right. But I hope they allow that. Uh, first of all, let me find out from the, the coordinator. Are we, are we allowed questions? Okay. Um, Who's the moderator? Thank you. The moderator? Thank you. Can you stop sharing? Yeah. Can you stop sharing? Okay, thank you. Please keep around. The questions will come. Um, Okay. We need now the GeoGebra and Peace Service teachers' performance. Zuta, Kocha. Zuta, are you there? Zuta, Kocha, Professor. Zuta is, uh, is having trouble with the, with the internet, so he's trying to find a spot where he can connect. Okay, is can there we... someone else? Yes, we got to fake interactive simulations, fake interactive simulations. Ladies and gentlemen, we are trying our level best at three. This session should be ending. Um, fake interactive simulations, Zach Mbatsu, can you share your screen and start? Yeah. We have 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah thank you. Mbatsu, 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Let me share my screen and then uh, present. Um, okay. Uh, Share screen. Uh, from beginning. Okay, Zach. Zach, I can see you are not a co-host, probably. Now, let's work out this quickly, Zach. Just drop back to the main room. If you can leave, go back to the main room. I give you co-host rights. You come back here quickly. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 I'll do that. Okay, members, give us a minute, and I bring back Zach. Zach, please go back to room four. Gary, Gary, please wait in room four. The next session will start at three. It is nine minutes in there. I told you we ran late. But even in that session, have um, the fire chart comes after almost two other presentations. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, Zach, we can see your screen. Go ahead. Um, awesome. Great, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Zach Mbasu, and I am based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am the African lead at the African Interactive Simul uh, uh, at the FET Interactive Simulations. And I champion the use of simulations um, on the continent uh, to increase accessibility and impact um, in terms of learning science. So in this session, 
I'm going to share about um, the simulations, and then I'll also share about profession development opportunities that FED has offered uh, to teachers across the continent. Uh, we all know about the various challenges and barriers to um, high quality STEM education. Um, I have a list of four challenges there. There are many more, and there are a lot of organizations that have done research about this. Uh, maybe just to mention one that our schools lack lab equipment. Uh, for those that have labs, they have insuff insufficient supply of lab consumables like chemicals and reagents. And um, there are many challenges to STEM uh, education, but the purpose of this session is to really try and focus on what are some of the solutions that we can offer as uh, FET interactive uh, simulations. So FET was founded in 2002 uh, by someone called Carl Wiman. He won a Nobel Prize and he graciously donated his prize um, to, to developing the simulations that we are going to, um, you know, to see. So FET is based at University of Colorado. We create interactive simulations for math, physics, chemistry, biology. And these simulations are really based on extensive cutting edge education um, research. So these simulations, they give an opportunity to learners to learn through game-like environment. The previous presenter has just presented about an environment where students learn through exploration and experimentation and, 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 and discover things on their own. So this is the essence of these uh, simulations to give opportunities to learn through the exploration, through scientific discovery and make discoveries on, on their own. So for example, students can play with a pendulum lab simulation and discover how the period of that simple pendulum depends on the length of the string and the mass of the object and also the force of the gravity. And within the same simulation, they can change the gravity from Earth, uh, the, the gravity of the Earth to the gravity of the moon and observe how it affects the period um, of the pendulum. So the goal is to make sure that uh, students learn through exploration, discovery and experimentation. And um, also we want students to learn like scientists, to think like scientists. So the aim is really to enable teachers to make learning of STEM more like doing and make it interesting for students to experiment and make mistakes as they discover. So we have uh, over 190 simulations. Um, um, we have simulations in physics, in chemistry, and in, in, in biology. Um, I can just drop in the chat box a link uh, to the website. These simulations are free. They can be accessible uh, online and offline. They can be accessed even on, through an application on a uh, smartphone if you have a smartphone and also on um, a tablet if you would like. So some of the, 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 uh, the ways in which uh, these simulations have been used is that they can be used as uh, in classrooms with a single projector that uh, is very typical of our classrooms. And teachers could use things like interactive lecture demonstration, inquiry-based learning. Students can make predictions. You can do uh, you know, clicker questions and so many other methodologies that teachers can use. These simulations can also be used directly by students in small groups or one-on-one -on -one if they have the, the, you know, the, the equipment. And um, effectively, teachers can typically use a variety of modes when using the simulations, depending on the teaching context um, that they have. So you might want to use these simulations as instructor when you have, uh, where you have more control, such as when you are presenting like a whole class lecture demonstration and other methods depending on the resources that you do have. Some of the, uh, the benefits um, that have uh, seen is that these simulations give an opportunity for students to investigate how things work on their own. They can design their own experiments. They can manipulate, collect data, uh, for example, about voltage and resistance. Uh, they can analyze data. 
Uh, then teachers can also put science inquiry in students' hands. Um, in fact, in places where teachers or students might not have laboratory space or equipment, for example, they can create their own simulated circuits and in the process learn the principles of electricity. So there is a growing evidence of increased learning when they use the FET simulations. We've known uh, from research, for example, done by Parkins, uh, that um, when students use the FET simulations, they show increased understanding and increased demonstration of learning as compared to using physical manip manipulatives. This is not to say that the simulations can replace the physical manipulatives, but uh, we advocate that uh, um, rather than uh, just using uh, the manipulatives, you can make students also see things that are invisible when you use the, the manipulatives. Uh, we have also seen some research that has been done um, that has shown the effects of substituting the simulations uh, for real laboratory equipment or using the simulations in addition to the real uh, laboratory equipments. And these are research that has been done uh, that you can also have um, um, a read. Now on the continent, we have African researchers that have done research on the use of these simulations. Uh, they have critically looked like, is it adding value in our context when, they, when learners use these simulations? And we have a number of uh, studies. So for example, Raman Rian from South Africa, um, he did a study where he found out that use of simulation support holistic conceptual understanding, uh, including remediation and also resolution of misconceptions. Um, and again, Chumba in 2019 also concluded that simulations make learning more enjoyable learners for learning abstract concepts. And also Crick did um, another study where they found out that uh, teachers' um, behavior and uh, you know, control and beliefs influence the use of actual behavior and decisions to use these uh, FED simulations. Now, in addition to providing the FED uh, uh, simulations, we, we know that simulations are most effective, effective when combined with effective teacher facilitation and use of carefully designed activities. So FET has developed a free self-paced uh, learning sequence. Um, we call it FET virtual workshops. And the workshops are housed on the FET website and they do include videos for effective practice where teachers share examples of how they use the simulations. We have readings, we have simulation, uh, sim explorations and also implementation of activities and reflections from other teachers. So this virtual workshop really lays the foundation of educators to implement teaching strategies with FED simulations. And these teaching strategies can also be used with other resources that teachers uh, normally use. So this workshop is divided in four parts. We have the introduction to FED. And here, educators, they learn about how to access the relevant simulations. Um, you know, for offline use and online use. They understand the, the, the research that is based on the design process of how to develop the simulations. And then they become familiar of the FEDS inclusive features that support learners with special needs. The second part of the workshop is about whole class strategies. We know that in our African context, you have a teacher in front of a class and you have eight students in front of you. And so we give an opportunity for these teachers to learn about how to use effective strategies in whole class settings. And these strategies include interactive lecture method um, um, where we get teachers to manipulate the simulations and then get students to engage in predicting outcomes and justifying their thinking uh, to their peers and analyzing outcomes. Then we have the third part of the workshop that includes the math or science activity design. And here teachers get an opportunity to create activities which students directly control the simulations, um, such as when they are working on small groups. And then uh, last, the last part is facilitating FET simulation use. And in this part, the workshop explores general strategies for maintaining inquiry-based learning environments and engaging in reflective uh, practice. 
So through special arrangements, sometimes we do organize for, um, you know, fed to facilitate a group of educators uh, where we have, um, you know, participants taking part in both synchronous and asynchronous uh, sessions where we get peers to discuss and review uh, some of the activities that the workshop participants have done. So what you're seeing is an example of a poster that has been developed by a teacher who has gone through this uh, workshop. And we give, through, throughout the workshop, we give opportunities um, for the teachers to make this difficult leap from professional development activities to classroom uh, practice. And we normally have a poster session and the teachers present this um, uh, you know, poster, poster of the implementation of what they have actually done with the simulations um, in class, and they get to share the experiences and practices of what they have learned. So this poster session gives an opportunity for the participant to showcase uh, is an example of a poster developed by a teacher in Nigeria. And this poster shows the simulation she created on unit traits uh, based on that simulation. And she explains, for example, why she selected the sim and the strategies that she used with the simulation. And at the very end of the poster, she shares her reflection of uh, how the lesson went and how she achieved uh, the learning uh, outcomes. So um, in conclusion, just before I, I show you just one simulation, uh, you know, FET is really committed uh, to expanding the reach uh, to more teachers on the continent and learners around the Africa to use the simulations. We dream of an impact of the FED pedagogies to, uh, that could have, could, could have in more schools and communities as a result of using the, the, the resources and also uh, teachers uh, trained. So we are committed to the student science learning, we are committed to teacher learning, and we are also committed to the professional growth through activities that increase this accessibility. So let me just finally finish by showing you um, 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 just one simulation, um, um, I, uh, by showing you one simulation, uh, um, just one simulation among us, the, all the simulations that you are able to, uh, uh, to access. So let me just put up, uh, uh, this uh, this is the FET website that I dropped um, in the link. You can access all the simulations here. So I'm going to go straight to um, um, a simulation. Um, uh, let me just select physics simulation, and uh, I'm going to select a capacitors lab. And and so here we have a simulation that Zach, you can use, Zach, you or learners can use. Zach, it looks like you stopped sharing. Sorry. So yeah, so let me just share you. So um, yeah, so what you're seeing on your screen right now is a simulation uh, called uh, Capacitor and Lab Basics. And this is a simulation that you can, uh, learners can use to investigate the relationship between voltage, charge stored, uh, energy stored and 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 capacitance. If you so the learner has an ability to move things and, and 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 manipulate things around. So, for example, they can increase the voltage and see what happens, um, you know, to the plates. And they can see the microscientific science mm -hmm. concepts like the feed lines, which are not possible to see in uh, a lab setting, and as they can also increase the plate area or you know, the area of separation and be able to see what is happening to the intensity of the field lines. In this uh, second uh, screen, for example, uh, learners can be able to investigate and, 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 and see, predict how capacitance changes when the plate area is increased or reduced or when the distance is increased or reduced. And then once these plates have been charged, as a teacher, you can ask students to predict how these capacitance will change when the plate area is increased or separated, or when the bulb is, 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 is connected to this capacitor, for example. So that they can be able to see that 
um, and they can be able to test this with different kinds of, you know, like, you know, voltage. And they can also measure, um, you know, the, the, the voltage across these, these capacitors um, as, um, you know, they, 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 they move around things and they change variables and they are able to, uh, to discover and then be able to describe how that charge drains from um, the capacitor. So um, this simulation really gives the learner an opportunity to discover things on their own, to learn things on their own, but also gives opportunities to teachers to design lessons and run lessons in ways um, that would not be possible um, without having this kind of resources. So I'd like to stop there um, and uh, uh, probably let the other uh, presenter present and then uh, we can have questions that are related to this. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Zach, for that presentation. I'm wondering whether Zuta, Zach stops sharing. Zuta, Zuta, are you on now? Zuta Portia and Professor Samson. Zuta Portia and Professor Samson. Okay. Okay, let's let's have did we get did we get Kennedy Momari in? Kennedy Momari, did you finally join us? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, just one or two questions. One or two questions. We've had so many presentations since we started. He's logging in. He's logging in. He's Zuta logging is in. logging in just now. Log okay, yes. Azuta logs in. Um, anyone who had a question for the presenters? By show of hands. Show of hands, anyone? Looks like the presentations were super and exciting. We will uh, request that all presentations are submitted. The presenters, you know where to submit the emails you've been receiving. Zambia, Zambia, unmute and let us hear your question. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Zaki, for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, which uh, grade levels does this um, uh, paid uh, simulation cover? What grade levels? Okay, Zaki, take that question quickly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for, for that question. Um, I'll show you. So um, the FET simulations uh, um, cover different academic learning levels. Um, as you can see, I'm just trying to share this filter so that you can be able to do it your own, on your own. When you look at my screen, we have like you can actually filter by subject um you know physics chemistry biology but down here we have different grade levels so we have simulations for elementary level or primary school level uh we have simulations for high school level and we also have simulations for uh university level so uh i've dropped the link in the in the, in the website you can access them and try to identify which level do you uh teach or you know learners are from and then you can select the simulations for your uh, academic level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, final call, final call for Zuta Potia. Final call for Zuta Potia. We want to move to the second session. Final call. Okay, if Zuta comes in, maybe we'll put them in the last bit. Um, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, let, me, let, me share, let me share, let me share the... Professor, we can have them, we can have them in the last group. At what time? This session is going now up to five. It's 
going all the way up to five. It is uh, 10 minutes past three now. It's going up to five, so they can come at the end. Let them organize their connection. Okay, sir. Um, during this time, we expect some people will be changing rooms. Others will be coming in here, but we also anticipated to have okay, a different modulator. Um, this, but we have Ndugu Martin. Are you on the call, Ndugu Martin? Mongai, Ndugu Martin Mongai, are you on the call? Maybe not. Mwanji PN, Mwanji for effect of robotic activities. Are you on the call? Yes, I am. Okay. Gary Shoina. Gary Shoina, are you on the call? Yes, Gary is there. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. Besongo Lomofala. Besongo Lomofala, are you on the call? Okay. Remarko Sakoko, optimization de la... Remarko, are you on the call? Okay, Wabumbu's Entrepreneurship Challenge. Steven Manjira, are you on the call? Yes, yes, I am on the call. Okay, Steven is on the call. And then Mr. Karanja, Mr. Karanja, COVID-19 Pedagogies, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have uh, did I hear Ndugu Martin saying he's on the call? No, Mwanji, Mwanji, you said you're on the call. Yes, I am. Okay, Mwanji will start 15 minutes. Um, Gather the fire chart. Gather how many minutes are you indicated for the fire chart? Looks a longer one. Uh, 30 minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, so then we take it from there. So let's have Mwanji start, and then Gary, you'll come in. Mwanji, if you can use 15 minutes, then uh, we'll do 30 minutes for the fire chat. I'm sure the fire chat will be very exciting. We are waiting. Okay, uh, but also know the effect of robot activities. Mwanji, can you take the day? I am Peter Mwangi uh, from Moranga University, a PhD student at Moranga University. I want to present um, the effect of robotic activities to secondary school students' interest in STEM subjects in Kenya. So that is my presentation outline. So on my introduction, um, uh, lower levels of education, that is lower grades, are very important in preparation for STEM. And therefore, uh, if we have robotic activity, there are many activities that can be done in these levels, but 